because I'll be just walking around and then some fear comes to my head about how to, to present it. Yeah, so there's this, the one that came up today was, uh, you know, we are an interpretive state. Yeah? There's an interpretation going on here. Yes, it's called self centeredness or subjectivity or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, but there is a everyone. It's like everyone uh, has the basic sunglasses, but the tints are all different. Yeah. So when you're looking out at things, you're seeing them like everyone else sees them, like a tree and this and that. But the tint is your the meaning that you give them, which is different quite a lot. Yeah. We have societal meanings and conditional meanings and and. Uh, religious meanings and educational meanings, but basically it's stated very clearly in this in this book called The Course in Miracles that you and I give everything all the meaning it has. Yeah? That's a really important, well, nothing's really important, but that's a, uh, it's nice to sort of entertain that. And you, if you allow, if you can sort of like, if you had, if you, uh, wanted to really extract the taste of something. Like I used to do it with olive pits, you know? You suck on them for a while and you keep getting the, the taste. It's like the essence of it. I think people do it with wine, but I don't drink. So, you know, they swirl around and they get the flavor of it. That's sort of what entertaining is. This isn't like digesting more information because you've got plenty, you know? We have so much stuff. We have so much something Usually the only thing that can bring about a release is if you throw it up and then you feel the emptiness, which is a sign of nothing. Now, nothing to me is the gift that keeps on giving, really. Everyone is looking to give you something, let's say, to improve yourself on some level. Yeah, This has nothing to do with that. This isn't about self-improvement. It's just an invitation or just a possibility that we introduce to the mind and then you see what the mind does with it. Yeah? So here, so let's just follow this little these statements. So it is a subjective experience. Everyone agree with that, yes? So you look at something, or let's say all of us are in what you would call the same experience, but we would have a different take on it. There's a, fav- there's a famous book by Gabriel Marquez, the guy who wrote 100 Years of Solitude, where he describes a murder in a, in a town in South America and, and, uh, from seven different points of view. And they're all valid. That was their experience, but they're all different than each other. Yet there is someone dead. Someone did get shot or got murdered, but every eyewitness a take is different than every other eyewitness take. This was just to play on this, this theme of subjectivity. Yeah? When what's, what explains that is that you and I give everything the meaning it has. Now, the way sometimes in self-centeredness, when you hear that statement, you believe you're the one who's giving it the meaning. Yeah? It feels like if you hear it, just in the way we usually travel, hey, you and I are giving everything the meaning it has, a sense of doership comes over you. Yeah? I mean, if you get it a little bit, you go, wow, I'm giving everything the meaning it has? No. But you and I are giving everything the meaning it has. And then you go, I'm giving everything the meaning it has? It seems like the logical jump, yeah? All right. You and I are giving everything all the meaning it has. It sounds like, oh, then I'm giving all the meaning it has? No. You're not what's giving everything all the meaning that it has. But you just said, you and I are giving it all. I said, yeah, but you're not that you, and you're not that I that's giving it the meaning it has. Yeah? That's that's where things can shift in what degree or what... uh, modality of meaning you're going to access, yeah? And all that this is going to do is going to react to the meaning the mind gives things, yeah? The body is going to see it, this conditional action figure is going to see it as real. This is you know, this is the dreamt object uh, functioning, yeah? It's going to re- react to it as if it's real on some level, yeah? That's a given. Yeah? But the, the one thing that we miss of the meaning the mind's giving it is that there's a you that's doing it or the you that's reacting to it. That's the one little point we don't see that easily, yeah? So someone can hear the idea that you and I are given everything all the meaning it has. Okay, I get that, yeah? I can, I get the, uh, the sense of subjectivity in life. I get that when I have an experience and you're there, my take on it is different. I've done it a lot when I speak, uh, spoke at recovery meetings. 
people will come up to me and say, I really like what you said, and when they tell me what they thought I meant by what I said, it wasn't what I was meaning when I was saying it. At least the meaning I was entertaining. Yeah? It was like totally off. And sometimes the words were totally made into different words. But I realized there's no point in, in uh, trying to fix it, because this is just what happens here. Yeah. So, okay. So you and I are giving everything all the meaning it has. And so, have you had enough of the meaning that that modality of mind is giving you life? Have you? Have you got to a point where, hey, if I can switch the channel, I would like to, yeah? If I could sort of, instead of coming from here, maybe get calibrated to come from somewhere else. All right, that also sounds pretty authentic, yeah? So you realize, oh, okay, I'm giving everything all the meaning it has, and I'm not really happy with a lot of things, like, you know, the meaning I'm giving things in my life is provoking anxiety. Okay, so what would happen, there is a possibility that if I stop that, there wouldn't be anxiety, yeah? So there's like this hope, oh, if I could only stop giving it this meaning and give it another meaning, I would feel better. So that's what affirmations fall under, all that stuff, where you're trying to change your mind. We're taking it back a little farther than that, yeah? We're questioning that the feeling of being you is one of the meanings the mind is giving, Yeah? In other words, I'm, this isn't giving everything. All the, this isn't giving everything all the meaning it has. Yeah, mind is giving everything all the meaning it has, and one of the meanings it gives is this: is what's giving everything the meaning it has. Yeah, it gives the mind gives this a sense of ownership, or a sense of doership, or a sense of being the alpha and the omega, or the sense of being the subject, and everything else is an object. Yeah. That's a meaning mind is giving. <laughs> now, we can be very clear that I'm giving everything the meaning it has, but a lot of times it doesn't go past that, yeah? Which you're still under the influence of the mind giving meaning, because you've been, this is a giant meaning the mind is given. <laughs> yeah? The feeling that this, this hybrid between body and consciousness, yeah? And the brain is part of the body. Yeah? The brain is what is what producing the electrical uh, pulses that are thoughts. Yeah, it's the brain energy animation of the brain is allowing thoughts to occur. So the brain is part of the body. This this body and brain spawned or merged with the idea of being conscious. Yeah, is like the bastard child of a crazy mental process called selfing to me. Yeah? So the mind is making this, this sense of being the subject by putting these two together, what you would, let's say, call spirit and body. Yeah? And now it's claiming to be the one who's doing both. I'm the doer and I'm also the seer. Yeah? I'm the hearer, I'm the feeler, I'm the taster, I'm the toucher. What I'm just humbly putting out there is that what I'm traveling as Yes, if there's a level of ignorance, is I am traveling as a meaning that the mind is given because I'm one of the everythings. <laughs> See, when you say you and I have given everything the being it has, this is a thing. This is an everything. This is included in the in that example. Now, most people don't allow the circle to encompass this. <laughs> They, they, they encompass everything else, but they don't encompass this, yeah? You and I are taking ourselves to be the context, observing or participating when we want, but then we, retracting when, we, when we're scared, but always in this, like, observe a, lo observe a lofty eagle's perch, watching everything. No, this is a thing, yeah? <laughs> and you are not of a thing. You are of mind, yeah? Mind before meaning is given, yeah? Imminent mind, not manifesting mind, yeah? Imminent mind, and we are manifesting mind, because everything is manifesting mind, but there's mind, imminent, you know? In other words, full of possibilities, but not in appearance or expression or manifestation. It's just possibility, like an infinite space. And then there's manifestation would be the infinite sp space entertaining a possibility. Yeah? So in this case, it seems like the infinite space is entertaining a possibility of separation. Yeah? 
So for that to occur, there's got to be an identification with a thing so that it can peer on to other things, yeah? and then have relationships. But not as object to object, but as subject to object. Yeah? So like when you look at me, I'm never going to be a me from where you are. Never. I'm going to be a you, yeah? You're going to see me as you. You may call it Paul, but you're never going to think I'm me. <laughs> you know? <laughs> There's going to be a very clear difference. So here I am sitting here, and from this point of view, I'm seeing you. Yeah? It's clear as day, what I can see is a body. Yeah? And I'm going to crown that you. That's the meaning. That's an easy pigeonhole. Now I don't have to investigate anymore. I don't have to try to peer into what you possibly could be. You're you. You know, a body, a girl, the pretty woman going here doing that. Yes, that's who has anxiety right now. Yeah, you're you. And then you, 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 you. And if I filled this room with 20,000 people, it would still be you, 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 just longer, yeah? And while if we switch the aspect of consciousness to over there, yeah, this Paul, who thought he was doing the seeing, is now being seen, yeah? You're now the I, in a sense, and in your realm of experience, you're the I looking at the you. Here, it seems like I'm the I looking at the you, yeah? And everyone is playing this role. To me, you're a you, yeah? To you, I'm a, I'm a you, yeah? But you don't call yourself you, you call yourself I. And actually, if you ask yourself, who, I, who is this I, you'd say me, yeah? So in all these yous, we crown up one special you, me. <laughs> <laughs> and we're the only me in this world. There's tons of yous, but, and in all of your experiences, I'm a you. There is no doubt about it. Paul is a you in all of your experiences. But I so just override that evidence, and I just proclaim, in a very arrogant, self-centered way, me, me, I'm different. You never understand me. You, you know? And I've experienced this quite a lot. Because I remember I went into a drug and alcohol program in 1985. I didn't just go in. It's not like, so many the other day I was here at a meeting and said, oh, I ran into a probation officer. I said, no, you actually probably had an appointment with a probationer, but it sounded like, oh, I was just walking and suddenly I ran into a probation officer. You don't run into probation officers. You, you usually are called to see them. So here is, I, I went into a program I didn't leave for two years. Yeah? And so I stayed there for two years. In those two years, I had a lot of opinions about the whole place and everything like that, all stemming from the me. And you know what? When I left it, I had to admit that my life looked better with them running it than it ever did with me running it. Because they had no confusion. They saw me for exactly what I was, which was an addict, junkie, you. <laughs> While they were pointing out my you -ness, I kept proclaiming inside, me, I'm different, me, I'm special, me, I need special treatment, me. And you know what? Seeing me as a you helped me greatly, which I cannot possibly do. The me can't see myself as a you. Try as, as you much, it will always be the me seeing you. Yeah. So what we're going here is just questioning that me, questioning that. Yeah. If I'm not that, then you could maybe, you can't expect, but you may be really surprised about how much the meanings that are given to life will change. Yeah. If you get back from the, let's say if there's one pivotal meaning that is in place that sort of influences all the other meanings, let's call it self-centeredness, yeah? So let's say self-centeredness is in place, which means you're identified, in a sense, you're identified as a self, a long-lasting, independent, separate entity, yeah? A living, talking, acting, doing, action figure. But believing you're inherently yourself like an island, that you are the, the animator, you're the doer, you're the haver, which is not true in my case. I don't believe that anyway. So here, all right, so you're there. Where was I? Right where I always am. <laughs> That's it. So here, here's the me, giving, is which is actually initiating, instigating, reinforcing, and keeping that field of meaning alive. 
The first meaning, in a sense, has an influence on all the other meanings. The thing is, you never know that's the mean that has a meaning. You believe it's you, yeah. It's never questioned. Yeah? You may question everything else, but you very rarely question the you. And I'm telling you, the feeling of you, the feeling, the sense wrapped. It's like a a thought wrapped in a feeling, yeah. That sense of being you, I would say, if you looked at it on a linear time scale, is the first meaning. The first meaning. And the first meaning is what escapes our attention. But the freedom, in a sense, from its effects is at the cause. Yeah? So you're going to live light of an interpretive life here. That's what's happening here. There's a dream going on. Yeah? But let's question, if you question the subjectivity of the me, and you find out that maybe, just maybe, just possibly, you're not that, what starts happening? A new modality of mind, using the same apparatus, starts giving different meaning to life. Yeah? And you react to it just like you react to the false meaning, but now the reaction or the response has a timber or a, or a harmonious balance. Boom! You start seeing blue as blue, red as red. A clarity ensues. Yeah? So you now start every... At one point, you didn't know you were like in a dark room, which drive even when you were dr driven to buy maps constantly, you still never put it together. What would drive someone to seek so much? Probably an inherent uncomfortableness, yeah? An irritability and restlessness that doesn't seem to go to sleep. Seeking just doesn't come out of nowhere. It's usually a reaction to something. So if you feel that you're not enough or not whole, what's the mind going to do? The conditional mind is going to seek for a solution. Yeah, I'm saying that's part of the fucking problem. Yeah, because if you seek for peace for this, you're not going to have peace. Yeah, if you seek to be free as what you're not, you're not going to be free because it's more a from, not an as. Yeah, it's more a from it, not an as or a by it. Yeah. And I'm just saying this because it happened. I entertained it, and my mind snapped to some extent. And I know the problem, if you want to call it that, and for discussion purposes, we'll call it that, from the solution. You never really get clear clarity about the problem from the problem, I'm telling you. As long as the identification itself is going unnoticed, yes, and everything is seen by you, Everything is had by you. Everything is done by you. Even consciousness you believe you're doing. You actually believe you're seeing. Yeah? You actually believe you're thinking. Which is incredible. That's an incredible leap. You can't even take a shit when you want to. You can't. You can't even... You're not pumping your own heart. You're not beating your own heart. You're not pumping the blood. You're not running the nervous system. You're not digesting your food. Almost every action of this, this possibility is involuntary. And yet, you believe thoughts aren't. Yeah? You believe you're the thinker of the thoughts. Every thought is like a seed that generates a certain sample from a certain aspect of the conditional mind. So if you, one thought goes ding, and then a lot of other thoughts show up that remind the mind of that, yeah? That one did you do. It's a very subtle activity. How could you, you can't, we can't even take a shit, literally, when we want, but we think we're doing this incredibly subtle activity? The feeling of being the doer is a thought. And hallelujah, you. Thank you, right on cue. Love it. I love the choreography of life, literally. I just love it. You know what you love really is the acknowledgement of it. When you can acknowledge it. A coincidence is really not much unless there's an acknowledgement of it, yeah? And that's a part of a subjective experience. If you can see the choreography of an event, and it just, it just produces a wonder and awe, like when you were a kid and you saw like ants crossing the street for the first time, you know? How amazingly, how you were amazed so much. That returns. That's just from a modality of mind that isn't self-centered, yeah? Just like the mind right now seems to be self-centered, it can be centered. It's a different experience, yeah? 
you'll have a different way of traveling. To me, it's an overall traveling lighter. It doesn't say the geography of your life will change, but you'll travel lighter over what your destiny is as an action figure. Yeah? You have as an action figure maybe 98 moves on the game board. Yeah? That's what you're going to have. And then this is going to come. This is going to expire. And maybe your little narrator thinks it's going to leave like a bird out of a nest. But it's just a voice box produced by the body. That little yapper up there isn't your soul. It doesn't exist other than it as a. It doesn't exist. First of all, it appears. Yeah. I've had events where I have almost died, and yet I came back. And I'll tell you something. You're not going to meditate yourself into a condition where you. The you that you're not can be there when you pass away. <laughs> because if the brain is producing the sense of you, sometimes the brain goes down. Like I hit my head on the water surfing, and my brain just froze, and my nervous system froze. Yeah, There was no me observing the event. The me was short-circuited. It's produced. Yeah, The feeling of you is produced. Yeah? And if you have a, a strong enough trauma, the production can be suspended. Who's there then? What is present when you're not? Do you believe that you go into notness and then you reappear? What's always is hasn't gone anywhere. Yeah, You seem to come into manifestation and then you went out of manifestation, but the field... Well, thank you. I expect all of you to say that. <laughs> Are you leaving? All right, good, bro. See you. Send the next person with more. <laughs> I just was given a large sum of money. I think it was from a drug deal I did about 25 years ago when I, before I was sober. He finally made his amends. <laughs> There's a thought or a feeling that precedes every acknowledgement of a thought. It doesn't precede being conscious of the thought. Yeah? Consciousness is what brings about the thought being noted by the mental process. But that comes later. So conscious contact is what happens. Yeah? So what, what occurs is, though, the mental process, it has one strong movement, which is called claiming. That's what it does. What I call selfing is really the... Uh, the functioning, its basic uh, primary agenda of all its functioning is to claim. Yeah, it doesn't have a life, so it claims a life. Yeah, it doesn't have a body, so it claims a body. This is my body. It doesn't have a. It doesn't have anything. Yeah, it's a phantom. So okay. So let's believe that that sense of you, yeah, is the movement of claiming. Yeah. So every thought is seen by consciousness. The mental process shows up a very, very fast in time, but it does show up later, if you want to call it that. And then there's a feeling that they were my thoughts, yeah? Isn't it? Especially because they have seemingly have your voice. But your voice is just the voice of this vocal cord. Well, how does it become your voice unless there's an identification as the body, yeah? Literally. How could it be held so so easily as yours unless prior to that feeling of being yours there must be an identification with the body so that you can claim the sound this throat makes as yours, yeah? It's nice to see this so that you can see uh, the activity of the bondage. There is no event called bondage. It's an activity of mind, yeah? So at any moment it can be you, there can be freedom, but not because you are bound, but by the seeing of the act of the appearance of being bound. When you see the act of appearing to be bound, that's what you would call the experience of freedom. But it's not freedom from the bondage because there has been no bondage. Yeah, there's just the appearance of being bondage. Yeah, the appearance of being bonded. That's it. So here, so there's thoughts, obviously. But you don't see this other thought that's wrapped with a feeling that they're mine. Yeah? Oh. This is like going to the U.S. Post Office's central distribution point. You will now see how the meanings that are being sent out everywhere to everything, where they stem from. 
And the, the central point is this bridge from thought, from the thought to the mind that has a lot of meaning, a lot of possibility to give meaning. The bridge is called my. Once a thought is yours or held as yours, and guess what? It's going to be laden with a lot of meaning. Yeah? And basically the primary point of the meaning isn't to clear things up or to, to promote your happiness, joy, and the freedom, is to be used as the bonding agent to the idea of being a self. Yeah? That's its whole point, really. Yeah? They could be good thoughts, they may be bad thoughts, but the real point is both of them act as a bonding agent. What a, what's the true bonding agent? Not the thought, but the mind. Yeah, when you see it, Jesus, I don't have to stop thinking. Try that. It doesn't work, yeah? Because you're not the one who started thinking. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> really, it's none of your business in a way. <laughs> but my sure makes it so, big time. So here, okay. So, okay. A thought. I feel a thought. Okay, something. Whatever. Then add the word my to it. I bet you it's heavy. Yeah? <laughs> now let's say there's a, they say 70,000 thoughts, but let's say during a day, four or 5,000 thoughts you're conscious of. Yeah? Doesn't sound like much. And let's say they weighed an ounce each. So you've been, you're used to walking around with 5,000 ounces of weight. You don't even know. You know, when you walk up a hill, you don't entertain, hey, I could take this off. It's not like you even think you have a, a, a knapsack on or heavy boots. You don't have any understanding. In other words, you're unconscious in a lot of ways, yeah? But, okay, so let's say, oh, I've been used to that. Now add the word my, and each of them weigh a pound now. You're going to feel the heaviness of 5,000 pounds, yeah? It's going to cause your life to seem to get really heavy, filled with anxiety, filled with regret, filled with hope that there's an underlying hopelessness that it's actually never going to get better. And the hope is like a counteraction that just feeds it, really. Yeah? All that stuff is going on. You're going to want what? Relief. Yeah? You're going to be looking, looking for something to help you. This is the starting point of most addictions. I mean, seriously. What are we addicted to first is the addiction to being a self. Because you can't be a self. So when you're never going to be fulfilled. It's like, when I shot Coke, it was never enough. No matter how much I shot. Yeah? And if it was really good, I'd r- rush in it for five minutes, but I'd want to do another shot. There was no, oh, that's more than enough. That's it for the night. I got this giant pile of Coke. I'll just save it for a rainy day. You know what I mean? Hey, you want some? Go no, help yourself. I've had enough. It worked. You know? No. Most addictions have a quality that you're never going to get fulfilled by what you're addicted to. Yeah? Because it's not possible. It's not the object. It's the mind that's addicted. And if the mind's addiction to coke or sex or shopping or this or that or gossiping, whatever it may be, is trying to get relief to a prior addiction, which is the mind's addiction to self, and this can never be fulfilled... Because you are never going to be what your mind presents you to be. You will never be that. You are not what can be perceived. You are the perceiving of that. Yeah? You are not what can be perceived. You are the perceiving of it. Yeah? You are what is seen. You are not an object that's being seen. Yeah? You are what that is seen. So this desire to become, which is what mind is doing, it wants to become a self. Or, what it really tricks you with, is it it always convinces you you are already a self, and then you want to unbecome that self you think you are. (laughs) So it gets you both ways. You want to become a self that, you know, you read magazines, oh, I'd like to be like that, I'd like to be able to surf like that, whatever. So you want to become like that, or someone points something out, you know, you're an asshole, Paul. All right. I, uh, but I get home. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I don't. Now I want to unbecome that. Yeah, this is it. You're constantly like a slinky. It never ends. Yeah, <laughs> it's never going to end. It's got it's got its own motivation. It's mind looking for relief. Yeah, first of all, from the original addiction, which is because it can never be what it wants to be or thinks it is. So what happens? It spawns. You need to get relief from that first one. So what? You drink, or you shoot dope, and you go, after years of recovery, you realize, hey, that was my solution to the original disease. 
My obsession with self, my identification of self, was causing such a discomfort. I, when I drank, I felt better. So it's not the problem, it's the solution. Alcohol. Coke was the solution. Yeah? Of course, it spawns tons of consequences for some of us. And then the more you get past, uh, away from the original one, the less possibility of ever getting relief. That's what happens. People run the gamut. They do pornography to the point where they can't stand anymore. They get so loaded, they have to stop. They get drunk, their mind gets wet. Something's going to happen, yeah? And there's going to be no way back. This is just questioning. And if I'm not that... See, when I say the mind wants to become a self and unbecome a self, that's not you that wants to become a self or unbecome a self, yeah? That's the act of being identified. The act of being identified, once you hear this, you think you're doing it. That's not the message. We're trying to describe what the mind is doing and then giving the possibility you're not that. So when you see it, you'll see it, yeah? It's not like, instead of see it, be it. No, you'll see it, and it won't be, it, the bridge won't go into being it, yeah? Or appearing to be it. You'll just see it. There's the, that's it. That's a nice way to travel during the day. Yeah. And I can hear that, but then you'll hear all the silence that's even louder than that. Yeah? When you look at something during the day, you'll be seeing nothing quite a lot. Your, uh, your mind's eye will be seeing nothing. Yeah? You have all of this to deal with this place. But your mind, in seeing nothing, never leaves its, never moves from nothing. Because nothing isn't in any location, and it's not at any time. So it's like, how you see it is a huge, huge panoramic scene. It's not like seeing a thing, that's called a form of looking, called self-centeredness. But in this scene, it's open and wide. And there's not, you never alight on any object, so the scene goes on and on and on and on and on and on. It never triggers an event. It never triggers an experience. Yeah? It's always so. Yeah? It's like an experience that has no beginning or end. Yeah? That's a very nice influence if it drops in here. Yeah? Into your traveling. It will, uh, it will just produce the effect of traveling lighter on a grand scale and it can stabilize, yeah? It can stabilize where you can get on with the, with the business of just being, you know? Just seeing, seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, touching, like Lord Buddha said, when you see, see, when you hear, hear, when you feel, feel, when you taste, taste, when you touch, touch, that's actually what's happening. There's consciousness in contact, yeah? So, in the scene, there's the scene, and it ain't you. <laughs> there's, there's the scene, and what we would call the scene, but all of it is seen, you know? There's no you in there. <laughs> That's the good news. I mean, if it wasn't you, you'd be sick and tired of it. <laughs> Literally. I mean, if I had to go in for one day, and let's say have Sonny's tapes running in, I'd be screaming for relief. Let me out of here! Yeah, but as long as it's me, I'll just hunker down. Oh, yeah, this is very important. Though I've heard it 8,000 fucking times in my life, and never led me in, in a good direction. <gasps> what? What? A novel idea? Oh, yes, Paul. Do this, and everything will get better. You would see it as insanity if you could hear it in another voice, wouldn't you? Yeah? It's called, the whole trance is built on identification as self, and it's an activity of mind. It's not an event. It hasn't happened to us. It's happening. It's appearing to happen. Yes? And you can see it, because you're the seeing of it. Yeah? And you, if you don't believe that's going to have a big influence, entertain it and find out. You may be incredibly awed over the years when you start traveling later. <laughs> you may break into spon spontaneous laughing. <laughs> because it's freaking hilarious in a lot of ways. <laughs> it's hilarious how serious we can take stuff. <laughs> Have you ever 
ever try to sell to someone else how serious something is for you? It's very frustrating a lot of time. They never do it justice. They really don't. They don't really get the weight and depth you, you have of it. No matter how compassionate they are and sincere, they just can't. You're just not satisfied. And then you realize no one is no one's getting it the way because they're not me. They're their own me. Yeah, they're not, but that's the appearance. Is they're a different me. It's very frustrating. You really, I got, I got something going on that's really. Oh yeah, yeah. Let me fix this plan. I'll be right with you. You don't understand. This is, I know. I'll be right back. This is my. Did you see my lovely plan? Well, I just got it yesterday. What? Oh, about you now? No. <laughs> it's like it's, you ever go to doctors and clinics? You gotta have a tractor beam when they walk in. They're already leaving. They're just like to treat me like a conveyor belt. You go, no, you're going to pay attention to me for a second, yes? Because I need some help, yeah? You have to sort of, or they just move. And then you're always left with a freaking worthless solution. And it's sort of like, well, there you go. Get used to it. Why? This to me was a solution that's worth its salt, yeah? It actually functions here. It's actually valuable where the rubber hits the road. It allows you to travel lighter through all the circumstances that life is going to have for this event. Yeah? It delivers the good. All these other solutions, you know, you just get left and you know something, something, but we're trained to take shit. You know? We're trained to take lousy solutions that aren't the solutions. All right, do this for 20 years. Yeah? This is like we're giving you nothing and we're here every week to entertain the possibility. We don't give you any practices. There's tons of them out there. And you know what? No matter how much something you get is going to lead to being nothing anyway. Why not start at nothing? That's where you're going to end up through all your searches and everything. You're going to end up in the statement they have in the Course in Miracles. You're going to have a realization that I need do nothing. Well, let's entertain the possibility of that now. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't mean there'll be nothing done, but the need to do things will be different. That's the beauty of it. Yeah? Especially when it comes to attempting to produce a spiritual you. Yeah? That's a lot of work, and it doesn't really pan out usually, because you are already that which you want to produce. Yeah? Obviously, if you produced it, you're, you're and, and being enamored with yourself, you'd have to replace what you truly are with your little false idol and then worship that, yeah? You'd probably feel it had more value if you attained it and achieved it than that you are it already. It's not that uh, romantic and it's not that like, a, it's not like a great journey to the mountains of clarity and the valley, the depth of hell and valleys of remorse. It sounds great. This is just... Dog shit awareness, really. You're just on. Prior to everything else, there's onness. And I don't see anything that's appearing in the onness can never get behind the onness. The onness is always, no matter how far you go as you, even as hot, clear as you get as a you, you always, you never get beyond the fence. Content is content. It never can jump into context. Yeah? <laughs> I'm still enthused about it. It's been how many years now? <laughs> I could have been feeling like shit a few minutes ago. But this is like a... <laughs> I would say it's more me than me. <laughs> it seems to have more sway, sway in my life than the me does. I mean, the me was really stubbornly not feeling well a little while ago, maybe. But <laughs> just blown out of the water. The me, I was right about that. <laughs> No, it's just every time it tries to stick a flag and claim its little sovereigns over something, it's like this flood of nothing that it just wipes all of its little boundaries and little demarcations. <laughs> but its its nature is just to keep claiming, you know. I mean, if it changes, fine, but I wouldn't wait for it to change. <laughs> you know, I would just see you're not that. Yeah, and get on with being what you are, which is aware, you know. You are consciousness, or you're conscious at least, let's say. That's an undeniable fact. You can't get around it. There's an oneness here, or this none of this would be noted, yeah? 
So there's an oneness. What does that oneness have to do with us? <laughs> Maybe everything. Who knows? So, I, uh, I heard it like this. You know, I went to a meeting, and so that's and my my head entertained it for a while. And events occurred, and things happened, and lots of downloads later. Here I am. Yeah. But I feel like very, that's what it's like. A lot of downloads. It's a diff, It's encrypted in a different way, not language. And it and a huge amount can come in a very short period of what you call time. Yeah. Because it's not of time, it's of timelessness. So it's a vent. It's, its quantity isn't based on how long the download goes. Yeah? And its quality is definitely not based on how long you polished it. <laughs> it just comes in. And it's crystal clear and vast. You know, vast like clarity. <sighs> I can't see that being anything other than what you want. I just can't see that. Yeah? And I can't see that I could become a you and call it me and have an experience of that. I just, I can't escape the own limitations of this. This is what's being perceived. It's not what's perceiving. Yeah. So. I bet you have no anxiety right now. Yeah, see, you had to think about it. You had none. There you go. There's your solution. Seriously. The anxiety has to be provoked because it's not here. So it has to be thought of. Yes? It has to be. You can't conjure it up because it's not in this room. It has to be conjured up through thought. Yeah? Thought. And I know when it's my thought, it's there. Yeah? I'm saying questioning the my. It may delay it may delay its being there, and while it's being delayed in that pause, you may get a sense of what you really are, which is there when it's paused, yeah? When the activity of claiming is suspended, what's there? There's still you there, yeah? There's still on this. Maybe just maybe let stick a flagpole on that and say, okay. Maybe I'm that. My way it went around was I'm not that. It was through a negation of it. I negated this phantom because I never saw it. Yeah. All I saw was a lot of fingers called thoughts and claiming of feelings and bodies and events and time and having all that be used to point to this phantom called me. But you never see it. You see you. Yeah. The eye doesn't see it. The eye doesn't see me. It sees a, a thought stream. Yeah? That thought stream is used by mind, not what's seen, to make up this feeling of being Paul. But the eye is never seen in me, ever. The eye is just seeing. This me is made up by a mental process. It's neither the you nor the eye. It's an apparition that's given flesh and blood by through the identification with everything that's going on, be it thoughts, feelings, time, everything. All of the claiming infers a you that is going through it all, a me. There's a seeing of it. It's like you watch it and its pants fall off. Yeah? You see it. You see it from head to toe. You see it. You see it being structured and reinforced. And it starts ringing untrue. Yeah? When it rings its bell, your attention and interest don't go running to whatever it's been thinking of or worrying about. Yeah? Your interest and attention just keep free-ranging. They don't get called to this fucking, this, this self-centered fixation. Yeah, they get called all day, like, you know, when you're going to get food and they ring a bell and everything comes running. Now the bell keeps ringing, all the alarms going off, but your interest and attention is still enriching you. Seeing beauty, you know, birds, flowers. I think I'll stop you. Smell, you look up, birds, everything. And you know what? Your interest and attention is the fire starter. Yeah, it's very, how can you have a fire that's not happening? Your interest and attention to thoughts about a future event or a past event is the fire starter. That's what keeps it ablaze. Yeah? It doesn't have a fire of its own. It's the my. It's you. What you're, it's the mind giving it the meaning it has. Yeah? 
the mind is huffing and puffing and keep blowing it, meaning into it. If it would stop or it'd be distracted, it would just be an empty like shell, that big thing you were worried about. It could be so extreme, like I've seen in recovery, where what you used to call the worst thing that ever happened to you, which is like a mental shrine, giving you reasons and excuses why things aren't working out, or whatever you do, you provide, perform sacrifices over this worst thing that ever happened to you. Sacrifice what you call your life. Sacrifice your dreams. Oh, crashed on. But this thing happened to me. Oh, it's the solution for everything, yeah? A really wicked, weird solution. Why, and then you're in a, you're in recovery for a few years, and that worst thing ever happened is seen as the best thing that ever happened. You don't see how extreme that extreme must point to you that there's like meaning giving. Yeah. How could the worst thing that ever happened to me be the best thing that ever happened to me? If it was inherently the worst thing, how could it transform or transmute into the best thing? It isn't. It wasn't the worst thing. Your mind gave it that meaning. And it's not the best thing your mind gave it that meaning. Yeah? It's nice to see the activity of dreaming. So maybe you can see that you're not the dreamt object. That you come back, you come from back here instead of here. I found for me, it, I, it had to happen. I was not having no peace. I have an extremely alert mind. And I stay up for many days on coke, and I'll tell you, I was in a fucking mental hell ever since I was six. Yeah, I was in a beautiful state when I was young. As soon as introspection kicked in, it got unbearable. I was uncomfortable in every situation. I'd run away from tryouts. I just wouldn't. I locked myself in the bathroom when I knew I had a pitch in Little League because I knew my record was I started really good, but by the fourth inning, it really hit me. And I wouldn't go. I refused to go to the game because I didn't want to be embarrassed. And not another time, my brother, get it out of here, Paul. You're going to the game. I mean, the head was totally fixated. Someone said hello to me, that girl at school, and I went, wondered, I went home and wondered what she meant by it for five hours. This was what it was like. I needed something. And actually what I needed was nothing. I tried a lot of something, and I mean a lot of something. A lot of one something. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it offered me oblivion, but it didn't. I never get, you can never get to nothing. You are that. <laughs> that's the beauty of it. And that's also the curse of it. Because if you're identified as self, you'll never find it. I thought suffering was in, in recovery, but I've gone to spiritual groups that aren't in recovery, and they're suffering on another level. They're seeking and seeking for year after year, buying books and DVDs. I just saw a guy the other day driving by. He stopped me and was telling me about some other person I never heard. And there he is, the perfect picture. He has the DVDs on his front seat. <laughs> you know what I mean? Has the stuff from paying $800 for, for a day or whatever. And you know what I mean? And he said, they told me it was going to get really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She what, bro. Once you get to the eighth DVD, whatever, it just goes on and on and on. It's almost like suffering. It's, so, it's better to be a drug addict because at least there's programs to go to. Spiritual Seeking, they should have a program, really. <laughs> Spiritual Seeking, Anonymous. See what would happen. You know? And the, the, other, the sick people would have the 30 years. <laughs> yes, they have 30 years of seeking. The, new, the people we lead would have a day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Only today, one day at a time. 30 years of looking for the truth. <laughs> and of course, if it's not found, who gets blamed? They do, yes, self-centeredness. All the dogs, you think the dogs will blame on others and vicious? You cannot believe the attack that's happening all day by your own dogs. Yeah? Shit. There is a solution. From a sense from the solution, there is no problem. That's the solution. But there is a solution. Yeah? So. Any questions? Say, yeah.
So remember, if you stop, you won't see, you'll see you don't have any anxiety. So it takes a little while to grab them again. Yeah? Yeah, so if you can take a walk, be somewhere, something that engages your attention, like a waterfall or something you like, yeah? If you really make note, instead of just going on the... Just swimming unconsciously on the on the stream of interpretation. If you actually make a note, hey, you'll see that you didn't have anxiety at that minute. Yeah, the anxiety having anxiety is an activity. There's got to be an activity of claiming. Yeah, and there'll be many moments where you feel a blanket statement as I have this anxiety that you didn't have it. Yeah, yeah. Didn't really. If you just start paying attention a little bit, not paying attention as Paul, but maybe paying attention <laughs> to that activity, <laughs> you are. Your attention is freed from Paul. I'm serious. It's not. Paul seems to be the direct of it now. That's only because of the mind. Yeah, your attention can see the making of Deb and Paul very easily. Yeah, you're in, It's very easy. So, there you go. Paul yes. doesn't ask the onus. Is it outside the circle, or is it more like the circle's in the onus? Yeah, you could say the circle's in the onus, yeah. The, context, the content is in the context, yeah. Well, it permeates. There's no content in context, really, but from the content, we need, it's a good way to talk about it, yeah? Yeah. But the honest is of no thickness, right? You can't see it. You can't see the amount of attention you have, do you? You can't see it. There's no place you can store it. So attention, interest, uh, awareness aren't uh, quantified. You can't quantify them. They're not, they're not things to achieve or to acquire, are they? And why would, you, why would we want to believe that they're finite, that they're just aspects or just... Uh, let's say, blips of an infinite field, yeah? The blip yeah, may only seem to appear in time, but what it is, it's coming from timelessness, yeah? Which is context. Yeah. After a while, you get some undeniable flavors about it. You know, they really ring true. It turns like into an, like an unspoken yes for me. And then there's just been a recognition that that's so... Yeah, and it's very hard to dispute after that. You know, and then then it starts to stabilize as a, a, a baseline, just like knowing it or not, that irritability, restlessness, and discontentment had stabilized as a baseline in my life for quite a while, yeah. This this is sort of like the other side of that where it's an ease and comfort a lot of the time. Yeah, and even when you had the irritability, restlessness, and, and the uh, discomfort, there'd be blips of feeling okay. Yeah, but they usually would come up and go back into the same stabilized state. The same happens here. Let's say, yeah, you can have an event, but the event always goes back into nothingness. Yeah, and then you start seeing that the nothingness is all there is, and other things appear. But they appear, if you could call it that, from and back to the nothingness. So basically, in a sense, you get a strong feeling all there is is the nothingness, you know, because everything is appearing in it and you know, everything goes back to it. So <laughs> I would say that's the prior state, in a way. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, my logic may be skewered, but that's how it works for me. You know, just... See, I find. If you present an idea, let's say there's a whole field of experiences you had during the day, right? But what would happen if you could have a template of principles put on that whole stream of experiences? You would see a pattern from the template that you weren't see, seeing when each experience was going on, yeah? In other words, it'd sort of be like this. Your, your awareness, like a camera, would be lifted up so now, in all the seemingly separate activities, you see a pattern that you weren't seeing when you were way down here. Yeah? So you lift up and you see a pattern. And by seeing one segment of it, it has in all the other segments of it the same pattern. So you can see selfing in one example. And then the mind can 
rocket it into an expansion by saying, oh, that's how it is. <laughs> like in recovery, they say any life on self-will can only be a success. That's sort of a very profound statement. Yeah? It saves you a lot of time and trouble. And they say self is what has defeated us. An incredibly important statement, yeah, because it separates us and self. And then it says what we're going to look at in our program, in the inventory process, are the manifestations of self. So they're not yours. Your, the resentments you're going to write about aren't your resentments. They're resentments that have, been, that have come from the manifestation of self. So self-centeredness was in place. So when it's in place here, it gets to express. So we're experiencing the expressions of self. And what's really weird is the thing that we're not keeps claiming to be the one who did it. I'm the one who did it. I'm the one. I'm the one who's afraid. I'm the one. How are you ever going to get freedom from that which the root of your bondage to it is identification with it? If you're identifying with it. It's, a, it's just like an impossible... <laughs> that journey's going nowhere. Even though it seems like you did a lot and went a lot of places, you're not going anywhere. Yeah? Because whatever you come in contact with, it will be used to identify as the one who's in contact with it. Yeah? Good or bad, high or low, clear or unclear, there'll still be the you that's, with, that's in relation to everything else. We're questioning this, not everything else. Everything else will be seen to be what it is when you see what this is. Yeah. It's like a, it's like one assignment for homework, not, not millions of different papers. One assignment, that's it. And you can you may only have to do it one night, one class. It can happen all of a sudden. One assignment. Hey, the assignment is you may not be that. Right. What is that? There is no that, but watch how everything is used to infer a that. Okay, let's look at that. Let's see how everything is used. How is it used to infer the that? My, the act of being identified as the doer of it or the one it's being done to. Okay, now that makes it even clearer. Just go on and on, you can see it. You take the pattern, and the pattern leads to principles, and those principles lead, and then da da da. You can't do that, because that would be like an intellectual understanding, but an understanding is a good substitute until the vision becomes dominant, yeah? Because there's either a view or a vision. Yeah? There's a view or a vision. Here, when we're already in a view called self centeredness views can be helpful, but they can't produce the vision because vision can't be produced. That's grace, yeah? You can entertain some possibilities, and maybe through this mysterious uh, grace, I like to use that word, it will incur, the, you'll entertain what's always been so. The seeing, you know? and that that becomes the vision of your life, which is much stronger than an understanding. All those things, understandings you held so dear, are really put away. You may honor them, but they're not valuable in a sense anymore because there's no need for them. You just rely on the vision. Yeah, the seeing is the greatest scripture of all. The seeing is always every day of your life is another page of the seeing. You're always in the scripture of seeing. Yeah. So you may honor things, but you have no interest in them in a lot of levels because they were all there to substitute to make the absence of the seeing a little better. Yeah. Once the scene shows up, there's no need to have a substitute. You know, if I wanted a dog and I couldn't have one, then I'd get maybe pictures of dogs or a dog toy. But as soon as I could have the real thing. The pictures would probably go, you know. I'd have the dog now. Yeah. I'd have the real, you know. Maybe it wasn't a good example, but <laughs> it just came to me. <laughs> Forgive me for not being perfect. <laughs> I've got to go to the insane asylum tonight. I think it broke finally. I'm going to be one of those people in like Ward 8 who's just going to be screaming, I'm on to it! going to be more Thorazine. <laughs> oh, that's just no self Paul. Leave him alone. He won't harm anyone. Why do you know? Just let him watch the New York Yankees. They'll calm down. 
<laughs> Give him some insulated jackets. He'll be busy with that. <laughs> Something that grabs his attention. But he keeps getting back to the same thing. He's driving us crazy. That's why he's in here. Yeah, so. I really love the opportunity to share this. I do. And I need you guys to do it. So we're all in this, you know, we're all this one dance going on. And, uh, Throughout dancing, there's a residue left. Usually, I feel it anyway. There's a sense of space. I really like it, a sense of a presence. And uh, it's like uh, it's like every drop of it gets soaked in by the skin. You know, you just really get really sucks it in. So, satsang, in a, in a sense, is important with association with truth. Because there's so much association with a lot of stuff out here. It's a nice antidote to it. If you have a couple of places to go during the week that you can chill out. Yes. That's the only question.